Hello again, everybody, and welcome to my podcast. It's called It's Good to Talk. My name is John D. Healy. Podcast, It's Good to Talk. People know me because I produced this book for my good friend, Stoney McGarn, and that's how it all starts. It's about his life story from 1941 up until a couple of years ago. Two real stories about his challenges growing up in Ireland, then getting coming to New York at the age of 16, I think. Various jobs and experiences along the way. Driving a truck down south in the 60s during the Troubles. So he had to learn a lot and you had to learn it fast. Stories are all true and real. Some are a little bit naughty. You can get it on Amazon, and it's also on audio. My sponsors are Liffey Van Lines, a moving company here in New York City, and they've been around, oh, as long as the New York City Marathon, and Liffey is still running very smoothly. When it comes to moving, let Liffey do the lifting, but you can't buy experience. Now, today I'm going to be giving you some talk about Halloween, the history of it, and all the goings-on with uh, Halloween. I also promised last week that I would do some tarot card readings, which I will. I have four people to do readings for, two ladies, two gentlemen. I'll just use their initials because tarot can be private, and maybe they don't want their private life to be exposed. So I, I will just describe the situation and help them with the questions that they have presented me with, or at least give them some foresight into it. So let me go back to the Halloween. So Halloween originated, where else? Only in Ireland. And it started during the pagan times. So that's way long before Christianity. And what did we believe in before we believed in Christianity? Well, paganism gets a bad press. I think the very name pagan makes you look or think or perceive that somebody is a bit stupid or whatever else. But I don't agree with that philosophy. I think they were very, pagans were very smart because at least they had a belief. They believed in the sun because they saw a sunrise and saw a sunset. And that was a glorious thing to say worship. They believed in the moon because it gave you light at night. It was a full moon. They also knew the moon was responsible for the oceans and the waves and the sea and currents tied in, tied out. Of course, the moon can also affect, that's right, your head. That's where the word lunatic comes from. And generally speaking here in New York and other cities, they put extra staff on during full moons to deal with the troubled people that are having lunar reactions to the moon and what else did they believe in well they believed in lots of things the sun the moon and the stars of course because they were like i guess like nomads they were out in the land and looking up at the sky the sun the moon and the stars kind of idyllic in a way nothing too much wrong with it and they had to be self-sufficient and survive on the land they knew that harvest time was the time to harvest food for the winter coming into the winter and all that good stuff. So then Halloween itself in Gaelic means sound. So it's the end of the harvest. So it now is Halloween time, this time of the year, coming up now into November, end of October, November. So those pagans had all their beliefs ready and they were hoping for, just like me, a nice mild winter, okay? Who wouldn't want that? So that their what they've harvested will bring them through the winter and bring them into the next year and bring them into the springtime. Now, when did what changed with the Halloween then? Well, interestingly enough, Christianity came along, and Christianity and I forget the name of the Pope. They wanted to put their own spin on it. Okay, I'm not saying they made it like Hallmark that they completely commercialized it but it did take on some new nuances. So instead of it being a a pagan celebration, they created more religious celebration. So that's where you have All Saints Day and you have All Souls Day. So a lot about the dead around this time of the year. I know when I grew up in my hometown in Denimoy, we would have to go to church a lot back when I did go to church and pray for the souls of the dead. That was very important to pray for the souls of the dead. 
and we had a ritual where we would go into the church, say some prayers, come out of the church and pick a pebble and leave it near the church to mark the prayers so said for one deceased that you thought of. And that you went on to do that for as many as you could remember, or maybe as many as you liked. It was also a time of doing what's known in the Catholic Church as the Stations of the Cross. So this depicts the crucifixion of Christ, and on each side of the church, going up the aisle, I guess, which I don't like to do, but for the Stations of the Cross I did, you stop at each photograph of the each scene of the crucifixion, clearly where Jesus falls three times, pretty good at falling myself actually, and then all the way to the end to where the crucifixion happens and takes place. And that can be pretty interesting and, and educational, if you want a better word, and uh, in, enlightening as well, especially if you're a devout Catholic, and I'm not, but people do pray for me. And I'll come to prayers in a few minutes. So New York or USA then took their own spins on it and turned it into the hallmark celebrations that it is with dressing up and costumes and all that. Before, now when the Irish came over to America, they brought the Halloween thing with them. And when they did the Halloween thing in Ireland, I think it was called Jack the Lantern, where you put a light into the pumpkin here. In Ireland, we used turnips, which are more difficult to carve, but if you're a strong Irish lad like myself, you'll carve out the turnip and put in the candle. Here, the pumpkins are more easier to carve, and then they can be turned into pumpkin pie, or if you're lucky enough to get yourself in Finnegan's Wake on 73rd and 1st Avenue, you get homemade pumpkin soup. So there was a side, I like those side effects of the benefits of the of what's left over from the pumpkin, how it's put to use. Costumes and the dressing up, that, that just comes to more, I guess, like theatrical of witches and symbols like bats and indeed cats all come into the Halloween thing and the bones of the corpse because it was perceived that the dead were near to us at this time of the year, okay? <clears throat> Bats, strangely enough, get very bad press when it comes to Halloween because they're noted as being symbols of death. Now, the cats get bad press too, which I think is a bit unfair, because back before the plague, cats were kind of thought as being witches. And I, that jury is out on that one. Other aspects of cats is, well, the black cat's supposed to be unlucky if you cross a path with a black cat during Halloween. Of course, what people miss about the black cat is the reason the cat is black is so you can't see him in the dark. So if you turn the damn light on, you won't cross over him, will you? And the reason the cat is black is so he's good at killing mice. And of course, I'm always trying to be empathetic. And not all mice are bad mice. Just like all people are not bad people. Mice have made contributions. Yes, they take a lot of stuff. Yes, they take a lot of stuff. They steal a lot of stuff. But they've made contributions to the world of science. And they're used in science laboratories for testing various drugs, medicines that have healed many diseases. So they're kind of relevant in that way. I know the bad ones are the bad ones, and that's why we need good cats. So I'm going to go on and do the cards. So what I did was I shuffled three three stacks of cards. Look at you, Justice, that's a good card. And I cut them into three sections. So I'm going to pick what's known as a three card read. So I'm just going to take the top card from each stack and I'm going to start with the two ladies that I mentioned that I would do the readings from. 
Okay, so let me take a card, a card, and a card. Let me put my glasses on, have a quick look. This lady, the first lady, I'm going to call her Miss L, because I have two L's, so she's L1, okay? And her, this is a good card. Oh, nice, two nice cards. Three nice cards, okay. That's enough for me to do. So her question is, she, her husband passed away a number of years ago, maybe about seven years ago, okay? And she dealt with all that, and it seemingly was a good marriage, good back in the day, whatever. But she still had a lot of mileage left on the clock. So she thought that she would, let's call it, spin the wheel and see if there was another man out there that she could have as a companion, a lover, a partner, whatever, for, you know, general things. And this was a good idea. So she was lucky, and she met a man, similar, in a lot of ways. So his wife died a number of years ago. So already they have a lot that, are, that is compatible, without even looking at the cards. So now, what is her question to me? Well, her question is this. She wants to know this new relationship, which has gone on maybe five, six months, not bad. Still kind of honeymoon period. She wants to know, will it last? Will he be faithful? And all of those questions. So she wants it to go that way, in the right way. And that's commendable. So dear Miss L, here is what I'm looking at. Your male partner has exactly the same doubts that you have. So if you are at this point of the relationship having a little, little bit of doubt about him, he's having a huge amount of doubt maybe about you. Now, will the relationship work out? Yes, it will. But, like any relationship, this needs work. And I mean a lot of work. You think you know him? Yes, you do. Maybe you don't. Your new man looks like, from the cards, has come from a difficult background growing up like in his teenage years. Looks like maybe he was bullied or had a difficult upbringing. Not, he, he was kind of put down, okay? I think I use the word bullied, but if it wasn't bullied, it was made little of, never got enough respect or attention, okay? And this is where you come in now, where you have to be careful with how you manage him and treat him and be nice to him. And then, the relationship will work both ways. So there are two sides to it. you got to be good to him, then he will be good to you. Now, some things I can see about him, he seems to have a stronger influence on my cards than you do, but I'll, I'll get to both of you. Certain things he likes and certain things he doesn't like. So he doesn't like PDA. PDA, public display of affection. So when you're out and about, you better leave that stuff for the bedroom. And yes, you can play hell in the bedroom because that's within your own four walls, the confines of your own space. So he's not up for, you know, being out in the public and looking like he's a teenager. <laughs> Neither are you a teenager either, but you look good, or at least you're good looking or whatever. Well, maybe you look good and not good looking, but you look okay. Not too bad. At least you've found something out there for yourself. And he's a handsome mug as well. So you are very compatible. So let me move on to see what else I can find in, in this relationship for both of you. Now, I see travel coming up. And the travel is coming up soon, probably early New Year. Now, he is, you are a seasoned traveler, and he is not a seasoned traveler. He is a bit like myself at times. He likes to stay, stay near his own community in a safe surround. Hence, that come maybe, maybe comes from his background. He likes to know his own space. 
So when you go traveling with them, you have to be conscious of that and understand that this is like traveling with someone maybe that has never got on a plane or a ship or who knows, maybe the subway. That I don't see. But anyways, those are things you got to be wary of, okay? Now, also, I see that it looks like you're going to lose something on the trip. No, no, no. It's not your virginity, okay? That's not coming back. You and Bono will never find what you're looking for. It looks like luggage, okay? Maybe a suitcase. So you got to be careful not to get into a tantrum about losing the suitcase. And don't point the finger at him because he is delicate. So first advice, before you travel, get some travel insurance. So peace of mind is important. Work hard at the relationship. Will it work? Yes, it will work. But you have to work at it. He has to work at it too. And communication is very important. It's good to talk. So you need to express to him how you feel about him. And yes, you can ask him. His name is R. You can ask him, how do you feel about me? And get some reaction. And if he's hesitant, it's not a bad thing. He's just being cautious. Now, you might need to pour some booze into him to lubricate him a bit before he opens up and all oh, lovey, dovey, dovey, dovey and all that. So with that, I wish you both well going forward in your relationship. I think it will last because, after all, you're a bit like two Canadian geese. You need to be together, to travel together to make out together and to get to the destination together. So with that, that's you guys. So I'm going to move on to the next lady. And then I have the two gentlemen. So I'll put those cards over there. And I'm going to move on to another lady. Oh, kind of cute. Let me have a look at this. Okay, so this young lady, kind of similar. Well, similar that she's a lady. And her question is something a little bit similar. She is single at the moment. And she is in a good job, pretty good job. So she wants to know about her career and romance. So well, too, your career has taken, hasn't taken a dip, but you are bored where you're at. You have a very good job. You make good money. You have good benefits. But you're not totally satisfied. Now, this is a problem for a lot of people, actually, in different jobs. And especially since working remotely and all that, you don't have the interaction of co-workers, you know, maybe to have a cup of coffee or lunch, coffee or a break or whatever. So this, I wouldn't call it isolation, but it's a little bit like that. And yet you have to work. And because you're working remotely and your job is responsible, and you are highly qualified. Okay, so here's my advice. By the way, the podcast is called It's Good to Talk, and it sure is. Subscribe if you like it. And if you're listening, this may not be your problem today, but someday it might be your problem. So do listen to the advice that I'm going to give to L2, this young lady. So here's what you got to do. Firstly, look around in your industry and see what jobs are out there similar to where you are at and more importantly, where you want to be. And look at the background to each of the companies and compare them to the company you're working for presently, okay? So if you do a bit of homework, and you can do that because you're a smart lady. And now, what to do then? Well. Rule number two, never leave a job until you have another job almost lined up. So you can put the vibe out there to maybe a couple of new companies that you're checking them out. You could send them your CV, of course, and say you're checking them out. 
Now, when you get past that point, that the step, you need to, at that point, probably contact your boss, whoever is above you, maybe in an email, first, to say you would like to have a conversation. I mean, a real conversation, like it's good to talk. Don't just send an email and say, I'm fed up with you guys. I'm looking for another job. That's not quite the way to do it. But you could, if you get the phone call good enough, if the phone call is something, maybe you think the email is better. And let's say you're pretty close to your boss. I assume it's a male for some reason. And you could say, dear John or dear whoever, you know, I've been with you, whatever, 12 years. I'm generally happy. But lately, I'm not getting enough satisfaction. And I'm thinking of moving on. Well, John is going to think, well, oh, God, we don't want to lose you because we have to replace you. So John, your boss, not me, might decide to say, well, hang on a minute. We'll give you a promotion. We'll give you a wage increase. And we'll give you more benefits, okay? Now you got to put that down one side of the page and write down, like I said in another uh, podcast I did, what we call SWOT analysis. The strengths, the opportunities, the weaknesses, and the threats. See, what's the benefits of this offer? Okay? And remember, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, okay? So that's important. So if the boss makes you say a good, decent offer, I don't mean a shabby offer, not just a wage increase, you want more satisfaction from the job. So you need a promotion and a wage increase, okay? And I think that answers the career side as best I can. So getting back now to your next question, which was on the romance side. And here I have the Father of the Swords, which is a very strong card. And I guess that's me giving you advice. Here's what's going to happen. When you get the promotion and the wage increase and the benefits, I'm going that way first. Then, lo and behold, come early spring, yes. You will have a complete different persona. You will be a different person. Therefore, you will be attracted to, let me back up, other men will be attracted to you, more professional men of a higher echelon, maybe than what you've been hanging out with. So you need to upskill for the work and you need to upgrade for the romance. So that's my reading for L2. And now I'm going to move on. I have two men to, two gentlemen to do readings for. So my next person, his name is D, and he is all the way over in Ireland. And he is dealing with a medical condition. Nice card. I like that card. Rainbow. Good. Mother of Swords, that's a beautiful card. And the Father of Pentacles. Okay, good. All right, what's your next card? All right. Place them there so I can see them. So D is dealing with a medical condition. And what I'm going to say to D is very important because I'm aware of when someone is in a hospital situation or a rehab situation, you know, it's, it's not easy, it's difficult. And what I'm going to say to D first of all, first off is that you are dealing with your medical situation extremely well, extremely well. And I'm very proud of you for that. So I see a glow around you, like a radiant heat. And this is coming from your friends, your family and people that are far away that are praying for you, sending good wishes, and they really love you. And this energy is really good for you. It's good for your situation. Now, you take myself. I don't go to church that much. I don't go to Mass that much. But by virtue of the fact 
So I'm talking to you and about you is I am sending you good energy, really healing energy. And I hope you feel that energy. It's just as important as the people that have gone to Mass this morning at 6 a.m., 7 a.m., 8 a.m., and have said prayers to you. And I know people that say prayers to you every day. And indeed, people say prayers for me too every day. I respect everybody's religion, everybody's belief, because just like I said earlier when I spoke about the Halloween thing, even the pagans had the belief in the sun, the moon, and the stars. So belief is important. So I will reference maybe a couple of podcasts I did. One I did with the scientist, Sergei Yankelich, who was a surgeon here in Sloan Catering Hospital in New York City, dealing with research on various forms of brain issues and all that. And I did give him the story about a gentleman I met that had recovered from three different, not three, seven, several different cancers. And I asked that gentleman, what did he put it down to? Doctors, science, and God. And I asked Sergei, he's a scientist. And I said, where does God come into it? So I was hoping Sergei would have a, an intelligent answer, because I like that. It's good to talk. And he did. He said, belief is very strong. Like to believe in God or believe in, have a belief, some belief. Even like the pagans. It's actually good for your immune system. And you will get stronger, faster, and live longer with that strong belief. So D, that's one t advice I want to give you. I want to mention one more podcast too that I did with a man from County Clare. The Burn is in County Clare. It's a beautiful place in Clare. Been there a few times. It's known for art and artists and scenery and that. So Oliver was the chap I did the podcast with, and his he has written books and has talks made. And his thing is, life is a journey, not a destination. So D, you have to think of it as a journey, not a destination. So you cannot be thinking of the end, because you're a long way, way, way. You're a long way off the end, long way from the end. So in the meantime. You have to walk the journey. You have to follow the journey all the way and go slowly. So life is a journey, not a destination. And that was Oliver. We, you can look it up in my podcast too. Now, I have a few little words of advice for you too. Nothing too serious, but just to give you some advice. Which I, like I did with the other two ladies. <clears throat> so I want to give... I don't want to be sound like it's all yes, 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 yes. So a few words of advice to you. One is be less critical on yourself. Be less critical on others. Even if it's only picky narky things, you can lose that by just saying, fuck it, it's not worth bitching about something that's not worth bitching about. In your situation, you may be over-concerned about somebody else's situation Maybe somebody is studying for an exam or something, and maybe you're advising them, oh, you got to work harder, do this, this. No, just like I did, send good wishes and leave it be. Now, if you have extra energy, and I know you text me a lot, which I like the compliments that you send me, and I thank you for that. Indeed, I thank all my listeners for that. So I think you could do something in the new year. I'm going to move my chair this way so people can see the book behind me. So when I got Stoney to write this book a few years ago, <clears throat> I took my advice from Maeve Binchy, a famous Irish writer. And I met her, where else, on the Late Late Show with Gay Byrne. <clears throat> and we chatted outside. There was a bunch of young teenage girls all circled around her because she, books she wrote were very you know, girly romance books, and they were all leader fans. It was quite exciting, actually, to see people looking for autographs. And they were all screaming, Maeve, how do you write a book? And what a very poignant question. And Maeve said, I will tell you how to write a book. I was standing right beside her. I had severe arthritis, so she had bent over. 
and the little girls were all around her. So I'm standing tall, but not ashamed of it. But I want to get the advice. So Maeve said to the girls, if you write one page every day, at the end of the year, you'll have a book. Okay. And that was my advice to Stone. I also had another literary friend, an agent here in New York, literary agent, sorry. I asked him advice. So a book usually has a beginning, a middle, and an end. So I'm thinking for you, my friend D, you could start this in maybe January. Get the Christmas stuff out of the way first. And write a page every day. Start at the beginning. Maybe where you were born. Reminisce on what it was like growing up in Ireland, obviously. Where you went to school. Who influenced you? Who were your teachers? What were your interests? Didn't you get into your teenage years? Maybe how you met your wife. Hello, Mrs. D. Your children, when they were born. Each way along the way. And right up until when you get to the end of the book. So I hope you like the project I've presented you with. Okay? And I think that's all I have for you. And now I'm going to move on to my last mail today. I did say two women, two men. So I'm going to start here. Interesting. More interesting. And finally. Oh, look at that. All right. Last song for a moment. Do a wee check here. Okay, one, two, three. One, two, three. Good. Right. That's good too. I like that one, Son of Swords. I like this one too. Okay. All right. So my next mail is Mr. A. And he actually is a Halloween birthday boy. So his birthday was around now, give or take. He's very fortunate to share a birthday with Bill Gates, Julia Roberts. Hello, Mr. A, you're in good company. Not too shabby at all. So he is a scorpion, that's a star sign. So I'll venture into a little bit of astrology. So it's a water sign, of course, and scorpions are very much career focused. They are good leaders. Careers they fall into are doctors, medicine, therapists. I think he's in that career. Uh, writers, journalism, theater, actually. And like myself, they can be a little bit Clairvoyant. All good stuff here. So what else? Let's get to let's get to the focus of this guy, A. He is very career driven. He's very focused on where he's going forward. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> he's so far forward that he's already into next year, 2024. So much so. He already has his planner, like I have a planner, like this. That's this one, this year. Mr. A has his planner for 2024. He has his name on it, his email address, his contact number. And not that he would lose it, he would never lose it. No, no, definitely not. So he's driven like that. He's very methodic. He likes to have his appointments, events, be, this, be them social or uh, work rates on schedule, on time. He's very predictable about time. And so am I. And that's important for scheduling and being organized. I don't like people that are late. Give or take five minutes, enough. If people haven't the respect and decency to be on time, I'm not a big fan of, fan of that. So that's one aspect to him. He is particular about other things in his life, also about health issues. 
So he wasn't always like this, actually. When he was young, he was eating junk food, okay? He ate a lot of garbage. But then he got over that and became more aware of his himself, his mind and his body. I did mention about the scorpion thing there, that the aspect of writing or maybe journalism. So I feel that he has a writing venture coming up early next year. This advice will be a bit different from what I gave D <clears throat> because D I told him like maybe to start writing a book like Stoney's book. That's more like for a certain type that wants to reminisce back and reflect back and enjoy. It's like really re-enjoying your life all over again and having happy memories. But this young man, and he is a young man, and happy birthday to Mr. Ray. His book, I think, would be more slightly academ academic and it would be more uh, enlightening. It would be more to educate other people on various health aspects. Now, I hope it's not another diet book, How to Lose Weight, because there have been so many books written about diets. I just don't have a shelf to hold another diet book. Between the Atkins diet, Herbalife, Herbalife diet, the cabbage soup diet, I, it's, I'm like, I'm like, I'm like a rat on a Ferris wheel here. And if I was a rat on the Ferris wheel, I would probably lose more weight. So getting back to Mr. A, let's see what else is going on. He is a very hard worker. And on that respect, he can be a little bit hard on himself when it comes to his social life, which he manages pretty well, all things considered. So he is more focused on his career and work. But he does see a light at the end of the tunnel where he has goals set for himself that he wants to achieve. And then he'll say, now I can relax a bit. I did the podcast on Mother Hubbard's restaurant, which was my restaurant in Ireland that I built myself. And there's four stages in that podcast that you should look at and see good advice on how to manage a restaurant, how to run a restaurant, how to build a restaurant. But going back to myself, a little bit like Mr. A here, I was able to envisage, visualize from the very day I poured the foundation, I was able to visualize all the way from the beginning, all the way to the end, literally to where I sold it myself. Every minute detail, including, of course, what, I'm, what the restaurant is famous for, indeed myself too, was to put in the disabled bathrooms, wheelchair access for people with disabilities, which brought me all over the world, Russia in 1992, China, Malaysia, South Africa. And that one idea got me to see so much of the world, which helped me to educate myself in aspects of travel, of course. Cultures and people, very important. It's good to talk. And that's the name of this podcast. So if you like the podcast, subscribe is free. I'm going to kind of move on a little bit. I hope I did a justice. I think I did. And I wished him happy birthday. And I see his career. I know next year, 2024, he's going to have a very good year, very solid year. Especially because he's already planning it. He's not going to be out New Year's Eve getting wasted in Times Square. No, he'll be up New Year's morning, totally focused, very focused. So now I'm going to move on, like to end this and talk slightly, getting back to the paganism, to Christianity, and then a slightly psychic. Next year, I will be doing a podcast about the electric cars with a car expert. That was supposed to be today, but I'm glad we did this because this is more important. Cars are important too. Now that I'm on the topic of cars, the patron saint of driving is Saint Christopher. And all the saints have various assignments. This, I guess, comes from Christianity and the church. So Christopher 
is the patron saint of driving. Actually, I would upgrade him now and make him the patron saint of Uber. Definitely. I know. Stoney drives very fast. He has St. Christopher, little statues of St. Christopher, glued to the dashboard. So when Stoney hits the pothole, St. Christopher doesn't fall over. I mean, see what other saints have got to you. St. Patrick is the patron saint of Ireland. And what do you know about St. Patrick? Oh, you know a lot. I don't think you do, actually. I don't think, I don't think, I don't think you even know his surname. Not revealing that. <clears throat> he came from Scotland, he was a shepherd. And he came to Ireland to help us with the faith, Christianity and belief. He was able to get rid of all the snakes in Ireland. I think, I don't know where they went to. I think they came over with the famine. I think they're all in Washington, actually. He got rid of the snakes. And then he was able to influence the higher people in various counties about the new religion to save their souls. And they became so good at it, the Irish monks and missionaries, that the Irish, we travel all over the world. As a matter of fact, we went to England, some missionaries, to educate them on Christianity. And everybody knows the hard work that Irish missionaries, priests and monks from Ireland, did all over Africa, and indeed especially West Africa. So that's commendable for the missionaries. Who else have I got here in the Saints? Well, surprisingly enough, and my friend D that I gave advice to there, who's in the hospital or nurse home in Ireland, St. Luke is the patron saint of doctors. And that kind of makes sense because you see a lot of hospitals named after St. Luke. St. Rock is the patron saint of dogs. St. Bridget is the patron saint of dairy products, dairy farmers. That's unusual. And finally, St. Clarence. And how they made a saint out of that fecker. He's the patron saint of breakfast. Can you believe that? I don't know where these popes assigned them jobs. Jesus. George Santos must be the patron saint of idiots. So I hope the four people I gave the readings to will find some benefits or enlightenment from the from what it is. You, my listeners, I thank you very much for listening. And as I said, it may not be your problem today, but someday it could be your problem. So if you want to e- email me, jhfornews at yahoo.com. I wouldn't be able to go into a long reading, but I can do a one-card reading if you have like a quick question or something like that. Okay, today all my readings are free. Sometimes I charge. I do take Venmo as well for long readings. But we can do that off this podcast. It's good to talk. So I'm going to say Slana Walia. Have a happy Halloween. And be sure, if you're going to get dressed up, get dressed up. Go out and have fun. But do be careful out there. It's a funny old world.